Thank you all for attending this virtual webinar highlighting the science and diplomacy special issue on emerging technologies. We're just going to wait one minute to allow people to log on. All right. Um, Hello, good morning and good afternoon. My name is Kim Montgomery and I am the Director of International Affairs and Science Diplomacy at the American Association for the Advancement of Science or AAAS, where I direct the Center for Science Diplomacy. I'm very excited to moderate this event today, which is highlighting our latest special issue of Science and Diplomacy, the Center uh, Online Journal. This special issue explores the intersection between emerging technologies and diplomacy. We launched this issue because the world is experiencing scientific and technological advances that will affect all aspects of our lives. These advances could offer solutions to national and global challenges and could offer tools, new tools for engagement. Additionally, they have the potential to create disruption and threats and present new challenges for governance at the national and global level. We are delighted, we were delighted to have received submissions from diplomats, scientists, and scholars and are privileged to have four of the authors from the special issue here with us today. For the program today, I will introduce our panelists one at a time. After I give a short introduction, they will speak for around 10 minutes. After we hear from all of our distinguished panelists, I will engage them in a moderated uh, discussion before opening up to general questions for the audience. I also wanna note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Center for Science Diplomacy's website. Our first uh, panelist speaker today is Professor Botazzi, who was the first author of the piece Shiny New Toys and Matchbox Cars, Vaccine Diplomacy Requires Balancing Emerging and Traditional Technologies. Dr. Botazzi is the Associate Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine, Professor of Pediatrics, and Co-Director of Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. She has received national and international awards, has more than 120 scientific papers, and has participated in more than 200 conferences worldwide. She is a fellow of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and was a Leshner Leadership Institute Public Engagement Fellow at AAAS. Dr. Botazzi was born in Italy and raised in Honduras, where she obtained her bachelor's degree in microbiology and clinical chemistry from the National Autonomous University of Honduras. She then obtained a PhD in molecular immunology and experimental pathology from the University of Florida and did postdoctoral training in cellular biology. Her academic career started at George Washington University here in DC, where she resided for 11 years prior to relocating to Houston in 2011. It is my privilege to pass the virtual floor to Professor Batazzi. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you and hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be around uh, this wonderful group of authors and contributors. And I'm gonna share a few slides um, just to tell you a little bit about my story and how with Peter Hotis, we uh, came up with this um, publication. And uh, to be quite honest, to put it in perspective, we have been working for uh, the last two decades on um, diseases called the neglected tropical diseases which are very prevalent among uh, poor people and they're poverty promoting, but that they really cause a lot of morbidity and productivity losses uh, in millions of disability adjusted life years and even in millions and billions of uh, economic losses. So therefore for us, um, our philosophy have always been that, you know, if we are looking for solutions to tackle these tropical diseases, we need to make sure that we are very um, intelligent at selecting the type of research and development uh, infrastructure and structure and models that we use. But more and more, we started recognizing that um, creating a value proposition in terms of business, right? Um, and which is our rationale was essential, which led to indeed, you know, what would be the key business models that we would eventually need to use to transition such products that are going to benefit <clears throat> so many people around the world, mostly in underserved uh, locations and mostly living in uh, countries that albeit uh, don't have a lot of economic power. 
Uh, and therefore, uh, we also recognize that uh, engaging with the community, ensuring that the community eventually would be able to uh, accept such uh, products um, and have access to them uh, was very important for us. And therefore we created a framework, uh, which certainly is a framework of this intersection between research science, um, in our case, vaccine development uh, with diplomacy. And honestly, it's, uh, a combination of multiple factors, right? It's not only, of course, developing scientific uh, interventions that would be safe, uh, effective, of low cost, uh, but building and strengthening the capacity of being able to produce them in many areas around the world. But that has also that notion of um, how can we engage accordingly and appropriately with the different stakeholders. And, you know, our mantra is removing barriers and therefore as much as possible, you know, remove this concept of intellectual property protection, having open science and sharing our knowledge, data and reagents, enhance cooperation, and at some level decolonize, you know, the vaccine sciences by promoting transparency, solidarity, of course, emphasizing equity. And honestly, it's a little bit of these concepts of um, leadership principles which require you to really think transformationally, but also be very adaptive. So we actually predicted this a little bit early on in 2020. We actually wrote a paper in Public Library of Science, Neglected Tropical Diseases, predicting that, you know, that COVID-19 could become, in our you know, sense of, you know, definition, a neglected disease. We already knew at some level that coronaviruses were neglected when they are not in an emergency. You know, of course, uh, lots of funding, you know, falls off the cliff for R&D. And we now see the um, framework of where we are now. We saw that LMICs were left behind very early on with access to uh, vaccines. Uh, and even um, access of even being able to produce their own vaccines. And now we still have an inequity gap where almost 3 billion people around the world, uh, and this map is very similar to the maps that we always see in the 1090 gap, where a lot of the funding always goes to the high income countries solving solutions of high income um, uh, um, importance. And clearly, uh, uh, only a very little amount of uh, contributions, uh, investments, and certainly access to solutions uh, end up um, in the low middle income country settings. So uh, beyond us, you know, there were attempts of highlighting this concept of um, in specifically in vaccine uh, ecosystem and manufacturing. And in fact, there was uh, early in 2021 uh, you know, an evaluation of what are the challenges uh, in this global space of supply chain and manufacturing. And even though we knew we had a lot of prior work that we uh, had um, with regards to advancing, uh, in our case, vaccine platforms, and there were unprecedented partnerships, developers, uh, makers, you know, that were looking for how to um, engage. Clearly, manufacturers. Um, information was very scarce and fragmented. The global needs were really changing, you know, and as you know, even today, uh, we have uh, not a very clear understanding of how we can bring in new boosters, how to vaccinate our children, how long is our immunity gonna hold? Are we gonna have to boost ourselves every year? Um, and the production capacity clearly is showing that it's not evenly across you know, the um, globe. And this also gave a lot of difficulty in you know, heads of state, policymakers, decision makers of really understanding when to buy what, what to buy, how to bring in these technologies, how to communicate to the populations that eventually uh, would need it. So some levers and enablers that we now know are important are the fact that when we look at emerging technologies and even conventional technologies, it's, for vaccine development, it's, it's complicated. Not only you have to look at you know, how to repurpose 
the manufacturing capacity either by increasing existing capacity, repurposing existing capacity, or adding new capacity, as we are seeing with all these RNA hubs that we're hearing that should be um, incorporated in the ecosystem of manufacturing, but also recognizing that people, knowledge, and materials are difficult, right? We need to build new um, workforce development. And that's where I think uh, it takes a long time, you know, to bring an emerging technology to become eventually a standard uh, conventional technology. Standardization and integration of not only assays and reagents and models, but especially the quality control and quality management systems are very important aligned with a very agile, uh, consistent regulatory framework, seeing how regulatory frameworks are not equitable also, you know, where we still um, uh, select high income country regulatory agencies as the considered stringent ones and not giving the opportunity of the low middle income country stringent regulatory to raise up. And again, creating again these partnerships with incentives that would be sustainable uh, and that would really direct how, you know, balancing these um, not only emerging but conventional technologies should be brought to the table very early on. So I'm going to wrap up again by um, highlighting the publication. Uh, where we uh, believe that you have to have a balance, a balance on everything, a balance on who are the vaccine manufacturers and how partnerships are essential, how we have to strengthen this um, uh, stakeholder community, not only from the people's perspective, but also governmental, private sector, and of course, uh, um, you know, uh, individually, uh, community-wide. Uh, the models have to uh, allow us to prepare the value propositions for these um, technologies, looking for breaking the paradigm of the funding strategies to enable sustainable and being able to fill the scientific gaps, but also, of course, you know, the entire ecosystem uh, of portfolio um, alignment, identification of opportunity costs, and really reducing the development risk. And ultimately, all of it in context of um, being able to combat also the um, disinformation and misinformation um, situations that we have now, and ultimately combating global anti-vaccine activities too. Uh, back to you, Kim, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Botazzi, for those wonderful and insightful remarks. You've certainly given us a lot to think about. Our second speaker today is Dr. Ford, who was the first author of the National Science Foundation and the New Frontiers of S&T Diplomacy. Dr. Ford is a Senior Advisor for Geopolitical Policy and Strategy at MITRE Corporation, where he supports MITRE's laboratory's work to develop whole of nation strategies, supporting US competitive posture and long-term success in critical and emerging technology areas. He also serves as a Senior Steering Committee for the Strategic Stability Project at the U.S. Institute for Peace. From January 2018 until January 2021, Dr. Ford served as Assistant Secretary of State for International Security and Nonproliferation, and also exercised the authorities of the Under Secretary of Arms Control in International Security from October 2019 until his resignation from the Department of State on January 8, 2021. Before his service at the State Department, Dr. Ford served as the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Weapons of Mass Destruction and Counterproliferation at the NSC, and served on the staffs of numerous U.S. Senate committees, including Foreign Relations, Banking, Appropriations, and Government Affairs, as well as the Select Committee on Intelligence and the Permanent Select Committee on Investigations. Dr. Ford is also the author of three books and many articles. He graduated from Harvard, has a doctorate at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, and has a law degree from Yale. And it is my privilege now to pass the virtual floor to Dr. Ford. Thank you very much, Kim. I hope you can hear me. And it's great to, uh, great, great to be a part of this event. Thank you for holding it. Uh, I should also say thank you for publishing a journal devoted to the important topic of S&T diplomacy uh, and indeed a special issue focused on emerging technologies. These are things of enormous personal interest to me in my own career in nonproliferation and arms control and national security export controls and strategic competition. Um, but it's also a very important topic from the perspective of where I now 
uh, or now set at the MITRE Corporation, where it seems clear that coordination by and between uh, the high technology democracies of the world is becoming really crucial as we work to build a prosperous innovation future, both, both in general, I guess, and in particular, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the competitive challenges uh, that uh, we face from, from high technology authoritarians. Um, I do wanna say that anything I say here will necessarily represent just my own opinion. Uh, it's not fair to, uh, to blame my co-authors or MITRE for uh, whatever comes out of my mouth here today. But um, with that caveat, thank you for, uh, for having this. Um, from, from where I sit, it seems pretty clear that the First Nations to master tomorrow's technologies, as has been true in the past, of course, repeatedly, will be the ones that are best prepared, poised to seize the advantages that can come to innovation first movers. Um, now on one level, that seems pretty self-evident, but it's also rather explicitly the foundation for strategies that we in the United States have seen, uh, have watched take shape in other countries, such as Beijing's Made in China 2025 plan, its innovation-driven development strategy, and its military civil fusion efforts. Uh, at least, as if you ask me, central to America's success, and not just to our success here, but to that of the other developed democracies that do face competitive challenges as a result of such strategies. Uh, central to that success is how skillfully our government will be able to work with stakeholders across the innovation economy, and how well it'll be able to use uh, research and development uh, funding, for instance, to catalyze new emerging technology use cases. Uh, there's a lot of stuff coming down the pike in the emerging technology field, and how we manage our approach to that is really very, very important. And it's especially important because while our innovation model still does work in uh, in some areas, uh, I worry that it's tending to, to fall short in some others, such as in uh, chronic underfunding of what I've heard called the the sort of valley of death, the kind of middle ground in the technology life cycle between uh, basic research on the one hand and late stage commercialization uh, on the other. Um, now we, uh, we used to do all this much better in the United States than we do today. And we still do basic research really very well, as you all know, um, in, in far better detail on this, this circuit than I. Uh, and of course, we Americans do commercial uptake and commercialization really very well indeed. But a successful technology ecosystem needs that intervening terrain to be covered as well. And there, I think we, uh, and we in the West more generally, have lost ground uh, in the connective tissue that bridges that gap. Uh, between the basic research and, the, and the, uh, the more detailed commercialized applications. So this is a key focus for US policy. Um, and it's a key part of the Biden administration's science and technology agenda, for instance, to stand up and get going um, a new component of the National Science Foundation, uh, what's called the, uh, I, think it's, I think it's known as the TIP Directorate, Technology Innovation and Partnership, TIP. Um, and its purpose is to, in some sense, to do exactly what I'm describing and to help translate scientific research into national solutions. Now, NSF hasn't, as I understand it, traditionally focused all that much upon bridging that valley of death, and only about 13% of its research budget goes to applied research. Um, but you know, there is an emphasis upon trying to do much more, and there's a fair amount of money, at least contemplated as we go forward. We'll see how the budget process evolves, but there is, in theory, going to be a great deal of additional money available for such purposes. And that's very exciting. Um, although NSF, of course, has a formidable challenge to transform its own processes and culture to support that kind of middle, middle ground valley of death work, as well as the basic research at which it has traditionally been so strong. But my point today, and I think the critical one from the perspective of S&T diplomacy, is that this is not by any means just a national question. We tend to talk about it in, inside the Beltway as a U.S as a US one, and of course we have our own you know, funding and budgetary and, and policy challenges to, to struggle with here, but it is not by any means just a national question. And, and, and frankly, we in America no longer utterly dominate the technology world in the ways that we used to. And it seems quite clear that as we go forward, building a successful and sustainable innovation economy and coping with the risks, as well as taking advantage of the opportunities that are presented by emerging technologies, all of this is going to need international cooperation and coordination uh, on, a, on a scale maybe more than we are accustomed to doing. And so because we need to enlist others uh, in, in cooperative efforts to move these, uh, move these balls forward in useful ways and to resist the competitive challenges of what you may call the sort of techno authoritarians, for all those reasons, it's really critical to build partnerships across international frontiers. 
Uh, it's not necessarily a new idea to use diplomacy to advance technological competitiveness, but I think we have special challenges today and, and moving forward. And that makes diplomatic outreach uh, and outreach across frontiers especially important and important that we reflect this in new organizational forms. And I think NSF's new TIP directorate needs to be uh, involved in this and working closely with other stakeholders in the US system. I'm a former State Department guy. There, is, there are aspects of this that are very, uh, very critical uh, at the State Department and that they're attempting to build out further. And I think all of that needs to continue and we need to do much better about having a you know, sort of a cross institutional perspective to engage with foreign interlocutors on in all these areas. And so as, as NFS, NSF improves its ability to work on translating basic research into applications and fielded solutions, it's going to have to work much more closely uh, with uh, folks like the State Department uh, and, and through it and, and, and its own engagements with foreign interlocutors to try to improve partner coordination and stakeholder involvement across a whole range of areas. Um, we talk a lot about in the competitive strategy business, whole of nation challenges and whole of nation responses. But I think it's also important to remember that the challenges that we face are much broader than just that. I think we need to do and learn how to do much better uh, and better still across borders, work with diverse partners and stakeholders, government agencies, private industry, the academic and research community, what have you, civil society. Uh, all of those need to be a part of the solution. And a key piece of getting from where we are today to that is diplomatic. It's diplomatic in the sense of formal engagement between actual diplomats, but it's also diplomatic in the sense of general stakeholder and partnership building uh, across national frontiers. And that is a really important game. The stakes are high and the issues are complex, but it's an incredibly exciting time for all of those reasons uh, to be in the S&T diplomacy game. And I'm just delighted you guys have given us all the opportunity to come together and talk about it. And I, I hope very much that your journal is able to catalyze the kind of uh, creative thinking and uh, you know, forward-looking wisdom that we need in this. So thank you again for having us, and I'm very much looking forward to our questions and answers in a few minutes. Thanks. Back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ford, for those very interesting remarks. Our third panelist today is Ambassador Chera, the author of Quantum Diplomacy, Rebalancing the Power Dynamic Through Emerging Technologies. He is the Maltese Ambassador for Digital Affairs and the head of the Department of Physics at the University of Malta. He lectures in atomic and quantum physics and is the representative of the Maltese government on the Euro QCI board. His background is in theoretical quantum optics, optomechanics, and quantum thermodynamics, but has also worked on experiments in quantum communication, time and frequency distribution, and seismic sensing. He was a science policy officer of the Malta Chamber of Scientists, acted as the government of Malta's expert on quantum technologies, and represented Malta on several European Research Networks. He was also the first Maltese member of the Global Young Academy. Ambassador Cherub has an undergrad degree in mathematics and physics from the University of Malta, a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Southampton in the UK, and a master's degree in entrepreneurship from the University of Malta. And so it is my privilege now to pass the virtual floor to Ambassador Cherub. Thank you, thank you, Kim. Thank you, everyone. It's been an incredible pleasure, uh, not just um, being invited to this, uh, very humbling, I must admit, but also uh, re real pleasure hearing the, the speakers before me and also I'm sure the, the fourth panelist after me uh, introduce uh, introduce the subject from their perspective and uh, learning a lot. I've been taking down notes all the time and I <laughs> and I it's, it's 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 a real privilege and real pleasure. Um, so thank you for the opportunity, and and I also uh, want to say that I, I I feel somewhat out of my depth <laughs> when when uh, following people like uh, like Dr. Ford, for example, I know who has a, such a such a such a stellar career in in uh, in the science and diplomacy field. Um, I myself am mostly a scientist, and I'm you know just recently moved into diplomacy. Uh, but let me give let me give my perspective, my two cents uh, worth of uh, worth of uh, opinion on 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 the issue uh, before I get to uh, the meat, so to speak. I just want to say that I, I, I found the, the special issue, you know, actually the entire journal is a, is a really fascinating, uh, fascinating journal. And I found the special issue in particular to be uh, quite enlightening, quite interesting. Um, also from the point of view of someone who uh, wants, uh, wants to educate themselves better on this, on this interesting uh, interplay between two worlds which 
unless you are in the field, you would think are very separate from one another. You know, science and diplomacy aren't always discussed in the same sentence in uh, out there in the world, but they should be. And uh, those of us who are coming into this will find this journal and this special issue in particular to be a fantastic, a fantastic um, resource for all of this. So thank you for this. Um, I also kind of want to say that I came into science and diplomacy quite recently, but before that, I, I was already kind of exposed to it without knowing. Um, I've visited CERN, the European Particle Physics Laboratory, uh, a couple of times, and it is, at least from our perspective, one of the one of the great achievements of science diplomacy. Uh, Stéphane in the in the in the Middle East is also a nice uh, a nice example of that. Um, I was at ITER last week, where where one of one of your colleagues was also was also a speaker. So the uh, International Thermonuclear Fusion Reactor in in France. Again, you know, a, a a a stunning example of science diplomacy. Everyone coming together to create things that will better humanity. And there is also an interesting link between the AAAS and Malta uh, through something called the Malta Conferences Foundation, uh, led by Zafra Lehmann, uh, that hosts very, very, very fascinating biannual um, science diplomacy um, conferences centered around science going on in the Middle East. So it, it is something which, uh, which I am fascinated by and I find really interesting. Let me now kind of uh, switch gears slightly, just, just discuss a bit um, a few a few points from from my specific uh, vantage point, my specific article um, um, about you know, quantum diplomacy, if you want to call it that. Um, I, I I wanted to approach it from the uh, the point of view of um, tackling an, a, a challenge which is on everyone's minds and a challenge which we are very painfully aware of um, nowadays due to the international environment that we find ourselves in, and that is cybersecurity. And something which is not always appreciated by everyone um, uh, who uses the internet or uses everything uh, connected to the internet, rather, is that is that our cybersecurity systems are, in a sense, flawed. The the methods that hold our information secure are actually breakable. Um, the assumption we make is that. Our adversaries don't have enough computational power to break into these uh, into these uh, into these systems. But this is an assumption which has to be revised every every so often because computers are constantly advancing. Everyone is constantly getting smarter and better at doing these things, and and so we find ourselves in a situation where the that which holds our societies together that which you know. All our critical uh, critical systems are connected to the internet nowadays. So if 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 our critical systems are no longer held secure, then all of a sudden all all of us will find our information, our power grids, our telecommunication systems, everything exposed to to attackers into the outside world, and that is kind of the the key challenge that people in my field um, were, were attempting to, to address when we started looking at you know, what, I, what we can call quantum communications. So this is a, a new technology, a relatively new technology that will allow us to overcome this barrier, will allow us to secure communications links in a way which cannot be broken into um, by anyone anywhere in the universe, which sounds fantastic. And in fact, is a, is a, is a really interesting, technologically speaking, uh, challenge and, and goal to, uh, to, to work towards. And, and, and this, was the, this was the goal. And a, a few years ago, a, a, couple, a, a few states, a few member states of the European Union, Malta included, we got together and we decided that it is high time to tackle this problem on a, on a continental level. And this was an interesting change of pace because um, when you're talking about countries like Malta, small countries, there is only so much we can achieve using our own resources. Um, it was a pleasure hearing sort of Dr. Ford's perspective on this from the complete other end of the of the spectrum. You know, where the you're talking about the U.S. technology, science and technology um, industry. You know, it, it can it can achieve anything it sets its mind to. But when you're talking about a smaller country, one has to be very, very uh, careful as to what, what, what goals one sets oneself. And, and therefore we got together as a, as a group of countries and we said, we can tackle this on a continental level in a way that will allow each of us to contribute in our own way, not just from the policy perspective, but also from the technical perspective, because we can now kind of com complement each other's abilities and capabilities and, 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 and so on. 
And, and this kind of led us to uh, formulate a plan where everyone contributes, everyone uh, brings their own, their own, their own, um, their own uh, background, their own, their own capabilities rather to, to, the, to the table. And it, it, in, I apologize. I went went mute for a second. In the case of Malta, um, where what was particularly what was particularly interesting is that um, by accident, so to speak, uh, we just happened to be at the right size scale to to be able to develop these technologies further from, based on the current state of the art. So we just happened to be at, at the right place at the right time to contribute in a specific niche. Where, um, which is being overlooked by the larger countries, the ones with a with a more developed science and technology ecosystem. So okay, so by coming together in this in this very specific, uh, very special way, we figured out how each country can bring its own uh, bring its own experience, its own uh, its own everything to the agenda uh, on the table, and therefore be able to contribute to bring this technology forward. Um, and it, 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 it's an interesting aspect of, I would call, sort of diplomacy for science in the sense that, you know, we are bringing everyone together to develop something uh, which each of us, as each, in each EU member state, is, uh, is not easily able to develop or not in the same way. Uh, but by bringing all these countries together, all of us can help advance the state of the art of the technology. And it's not, it is not just developing technology for its own sake or for science's sake. Uh, it is also developing all of this whilst uh, working towards a goal which is of fundamental critical importance to all of us. And that, from the perspective of a small country, again, is fantastic because you, you find yourself in a position where you can contribute to this goal, where you can do something which will uh, have a positive effect, not just at the individual scale, not just at the scale of our scientific uh, scientific community, but really at the continental and eventually global scale, be able to uh, contribute to the creation of a new scientific, new technological e ecosystem. So, so this could only happen by engaging with each other in this diplomatic context and pushing this forward. Um, and I think I'm kind of uh, running out of time, so I'm just going to stop here for for a uh, for a while, and then we can uh, we can continue this discussion. So thank you again, and it's an enormous pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for those really interesting remarks, which has has given us a lot to think about as well. And so our last speaker today is Dr. Butch, who was the first author of Engineering Diplomacy: How AI and Human Augmentation Could Remake the Art of Foreign Relations. She is a postdoctoral fellow and has studied science diplomacy at Rockefeller University as part of the Hartford Science Diplomacy Initiative. Her areas of research include neuroimaging, machine learning, behavioral neuromodulation, ultrasonics, and bioinformatics. Her research and science communication have been featured by the Dana Foundation and the Story Collider. She has been published in top academic journals, including neuro, uh, psycho, Pharmacology and Nature, and has founded multiple seminar series, including the Frontiers in Neuropsychiatry Seminars at Wild Court Cornell Medicine. Beyond her science endeavors, she's a visual artist and studies painting and drawing. She received her BA in Biophysics from Columbia University and her PhD from Well Cornell Medicine at Cornell University. And so it's my privilege to pass the virtual floor to Dr. Butch. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my slides. Can you see them? Yes, we can, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here and a great pleasure to be able to discuss science diplomacy and emerging technologies with all of you and also with the incredible other panelists. So I'll tell you a little bit about our article on engineering diplomacy, how AI and human augmentation could remake the art of foreign relations. And I also want to highlight that this work was in collaboration with my incredible co-authors, Dr. David Eagleman and Dr. Logan Grosnick. So as we've been discussing, the pace of technologies is rapidly accelerating and our world is becoming more and more interconnected. So in our article, we envisioned artificial intelligence paired with emergent human augmentation technologies as being able to increase the bandwidth, speed, and optimality of the practice of diplomacy. However, this is going to require collaborations among diplomats, scientists, and engineers, such as my fellow panelists and 
a, a number of the people who are probably watching this talk and conversation. And it's also going to require organizational adaptation that it's going to need to incorporate training in, integration of, and the distribution of resources for AI. So science diplomacy could help facilitate international cooperation here to tackle global challenges that human augmented AI could address. And we believe it's going to be instrumental in advancing our knowledge of AI and that deploying AI to solve real world problems will be a great tool and that we can also enhance international synergy of AI and AI research and the knowledge exchange here. So overall, AI with the human augmentation can help to surface meaning from a deluge of data, can help policymakers to coordinate shared objectives and prevent crises. So one field of AI that has tremendous advances in recent years is called natural language processing, which enables processing, analyzing, and synthesizing of huge amounts of spoken and written human language. You might be familiar, most familiar with the use of this in virtual assistants, like Google Assistant, Alexa, or Siri on your smartphone or home device. But there's also a lot of other really powerful applications of it that have kind of been unlocked. And now there's great potential for it to be deployed as a, as a tool to aid in diplomacy and policymaking. So one interesting example of this that, I, we, that we mentioned in our article, and I'll tell you a little more about, is the UN Global Pulse Initiative. And UN Global Pulse is actually implementing machine learning research to study how transcription and translation inaccuracies in radio shows in Uganda can lead to misconceptions and in turn cognitive biases, which could contribute to social tensions. And this is, this is really powerful because over 7.5 million words are spoken daily on Ugandan radio. So it's a major form of which information is communicated in Uganda among the public. So UN Global Pulse has been developing a public radio content analysis tool here. And this tool could support decision making through analysis of public radio content. It, could, it uses speech to text technology and big data analytics with machine learning. And this could enable things like real time monitoring of health service quality, also identifying early on potential misinformation that could spread, for example, on emerging public health challenges like the current COVID-19 pandemic, and also evaluating the effectiveness of UN and government campaigns on having a positive influence on public opinion. And natural language processing has also tremendous potential for summarizing key points of written text, large texts. And this has recently been demonstrated by OpenAI. In fact, another application of this is that this technology could be deployed to translate unreadably large amounts of foreign text. So AI machine translation processes that could aid human translators could actually facilitate the translation of these huge volumes of data and text and help streamline, for example, legal processes that are required for international diplomacy. And another kind of future application is thinking about how natural language processing could have implications for diplomatic communications at the global level. There is over 6,000 languages in use worldwide and translation errors by humans have frequently impeded diplomatic communication. So by leveraging these major recent advances in the natural language processing, diplomats could help to mitigate the risk of mistranslations and miscommunications, which could disadvantage or even obstruct their negotiations. So another emerging technology is human augmentation devices, and this can be paired with AI and human in the loop AI. And this has also great potential for diplomacy and policy making. So a lot of research, I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist and engineer, and there have been decades of scientific research which have revealed how there's limitations in human senses and human information processing bandwidth, and that this actually affects how we make decisions and solve problems, and can also lead to cognitive biases, which lead to us not to make the most optimal decisions. 
So we could actually outsource cognitive tasks to AI to reduce data and decision-making complexity. And there's these new hardware technologies that could help to enhance our sensory systems and increase the, the rate of transferring of information between AI algorithms and humans. So one of these is what I'm highlighting here is called a sensory augmentation device. Here, this is a device by Neosensory that is a wearable technology. And this can extend the perceptual experience. It feeds information to humans wearing the technology by converting external information, in this case, sound, into vibrotactile feedback. And so this can actually help uh, one application that's being explored is helping people who are deaf to be able to hear the sounds around them and also to, to kind of, it it's could be like a, another technology that could be instead of a cochlear implant, which has limitations and is very expensive. But this could all, technology and other technologies like Neuralink or other human augmentation technologies could be used to feed different types of information and uh, in real time during exchanges uh, in negotiations, for example. And AI can also be used in real time or near real time remote sensing. And here's kind of an overview of that here. This could help to aid in conflict resource monitoring, disease control and prevention, tracking genocides and monitoring human rights. And I'll show you a few examples of satellite imaging. So this is very recent and relevant. For example, here I'm showing you high resolution satellite imaging, detecting troops amassing at the borders. This was in mid-February prior to Russia invading Ukraine. And so this real-time tracking with satellite imaging could be used to detect troops amassing at borders. Similarly, satellite imaging can also track humanitarian crises. So here are satellite images of Deir Hassan in Syria near the border that revealed that there was a rapid growth of refugee camps during ongoing Syrian civil war. Uh, and this was taken, shown between 2019 and 2020. And so this can help uh, the international community to understand how to give resources to help refugee crises. And it's also helped to resolve military conflicts, such as the 2020 China-India skirmish in the Gaolin Valley, where satellite imaging confirmed that there was a disengagement of the Chinese troops, so they retreated from the disputed territory. And so this helped to uh, provide confidence during the negotiations. And finally, human augmented AI can also be used for gathering, filtering, simulating, or forecasting possible outcomes and making recommendations. So deployed for diplomacy, this could synthesize the viewpoints of many actors into multi-objective goals, and then rec recommend more optimal decisions. For example, it could optimize solutions to several problems simultaneously in multilateral diplomacy, involving things like impasses on energy or immigration or trade. And this is actually being simulated in a, for a board game called Diplomacy that requires mixed mode of many agent interactions and has over 10,000 possible game sequences in a 20 move game. And so there's, you know, this kind of provides the seeds for what we could imagine as future uses of AI for simulations of solving complex problems. So overall, I've shown you a lot of exciting applications of these technologies. And of course, there are some uh, limitations and concerns about the ethics. So we can talk more about that in the discussion. And so I'd like to again, acknowledge my wonderful collaborators. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for their remarks and their presentations. Um, you have all raised significant points and have clearly laid out why this is such an important issue to discuss. 
And so to begin the Q&A, we're gonna have a moderated question session where I will ask the panelists three questions, and then we're gonna open up the uh, Q&A to general questions from the audience. I do wanna remind people, I know people are already putting their questions um, in the Q&A feature, but just to remind people to use the Q&A feature to ask your questions, and please indicate if your question is for one or all of the panelists. Um, and to begin this, as Bill Kuglazer and I reviewed in our editorial, which was published for the special issue, emerging technologies span scientific and technical disciplines, are being developed at incredible speed, and have the potential to solve national and global problems. However, they also come with risks, including the potential to reshape the world order and disrupt global stability. With these potential risks and benefits, it's not surprising that emerging technologies have become the focus of national governments and international institutions. And so my first question for the panelists focuses on that challenge of emerging technologies for diplomacy in the sense that they cover the scientific enterprise, have diverse applications, and relate to other policy issues. This makes it challenging to provide scientific advice to policymakers and diplomats. And so from your viewpoint, are appropriate structures in place to provide decision makers with scientific advice on emerging technologies? If yes, what are they and how are they working? Um, and if not, what would you suggest to, to put in place? And so for the order of response, we're gonna start with you, Dr. Ford. Okay, well, I'll take a, a swing at it, I suppose. I, I guess uh, on the basis of my experience, I, I would say the answer depends a bit about which policymakers you're you're talking about? Um, I mean, from my current vantage point at, uh, at Mitre Labs, for instance, uh, and Mitre Corporation more generally, the federal sponsors of our work seem really quite technology savvy. Now, I guess on one level that's not terribly surprising because we are working with them precisely because, for the most part, they tend to be on the sort of acquisition and tech development side of uh, of the federal uh, the federal enterprise. Um, I guess if you were to ask me to look back at my my years in the executive branch uh, you know, as a Senate staffer in what are generally non-technical areas of the foreign policy and national security community, my answer would be a little more mixed. Um, yeah, and it, it is the case that scientific advice, including on some pretty exotic emerging technology issues, is certainly available to senior leaders if a policymaker asks for it, for instance. And at least in my experience, most departments and agencies can do a pretty decent job of providing, uh, you know, basic science and technology advice, including on exotic things, to policymakers when asked. Uh, and that's even before you get to the process of turning to really deep reservoirs of expertise in places like the National Laboratories, um, who are always you know, very good about coming up and briefing you if you, if you want to hear about something exotic. Um, but I guess the biggest problem institutionally uh, across the system isn't so much getting the occasional uh, by request or, you know, uh, we think you need to hear this, sir, kind of briefing. And those are amazing and critical when they need to happen to be sure. But the biggest problem isn't that, it's more sort of, it's more one that I think is a bit harder and slower to fix. And that is to ensure that decision makers understand at least something um, about emerging technologies well enough and, and have kind of the potential to sort of have these things be on the, I don't know, is it the tip of their mind, if you will. Um, to have these issues be sort of foregrounded for them in their heads uh, enough that they can think about emerging technology issues as sort of routinely and architecturally in policymaking work, as is routine for uh, you know, uh, tracking economic events or or military news or media headlines or or what have you. Um, you know, we do those things. Our antennae are well set for that in the non-technical world. They're not so well set for the quantum apocalypse of what happens when uh, you know someone perhaps gets a really good quantum computer for the first time and manages to, to crush all existing cryptography, things like that. That is not a foregrounded issue to some extent, but you know maybe some of those sorts of things should be. So fixing that is slower um, and getting those you know, getting technology issues to be reflected in policymakers' reflexes, if you will, uh, is going to take you know some more time um, in the non-technical areas that, for better or for worse, I come out of. Uh, and so, for that reason, that's why I think it's really important to have more connective tissue between the S and T world and the the policy world, the policy and diplomatic world. Um, you know, each of those communities needs to do more to you know learn to speak each other's language, if that's a way to sort of put it, and you know acquire some kind of Berlitz level phrase book. You know, elementary fluency, so they can use that as a foundation upon which gradually to build uh, better understandings and to improve those reflexes. You know, I don't have to be an economist to be a diplomat at the State Department, but I can't know 
know nothing about economics and I know what if I have to know how to have a conversation with the people who can give the kind of advice that I need. Those things all need to be true in the tech world as well. So building those technology instincts into the non-technical pieces of the policy and diplomatic world is really important. Um, that's one of the reasons why I and, and my terrific collaborators uh, at, at MITRE, you know, Amy Akama, Matt McGregor, Colin Murphy, we were so pleased to be able to, to you know, put together the article that you also kindly published in the sense that we hope that that will be, you know, part of an ongoing conversation of catalyzing more thinking about this in both the policy side and the s and side uh, and getting them to work better together over time. And, uh, you know, that's not a quick fix, but I don't think it is an it's not at all impossible, it's quite doable. Uh, we just have to you know, continue to focus on it. And you all at the, the AAAS are doing just the kinds of things that one needs to, uh, to, to provide catalytic help on this. So thanks once again. Well, thank you very much. And certainly it's part of AAAS's mission to try to do a better job of connecting science with society. And so we're seeing uh, the scientific issues that we need to do a better job of, of connecting to policymakers um, and society broadly here. Um, I'm going to pass the virtual floor to Ambassador Cherub for his response on that first question. Hi, hi, thank you. Um, I, I was I was briefly offline, as you know, I've, I've been having connectivity issues today, so I, I do uh, apologize for that. Um, there's only so much you can do sometimes. Uh, the age of Zoom. Um, I, I, I'm i really fascinated again by uh, by by both the, the questions being asked and the um, uh, the, the the viewpoint which we've heard so far. Um, I I have an interesting, perhaps, or a different experience uh, to uh, to Dr. Ford in in, in kind of in, in looking at this uh, at this again because I come from a completely different end of the scale here. Um, there is no, am I disconnected again? Um, we can still hear you. We can't see you, but maybe we'll give you a moment to to fix your technical issues, and we'll go to Dr. Butch now for the to get her response. Sure. So. I don't know if you heard, but um, so yeah, so from my perspective is also different from Dr. Ford's and it's really interesting to hear the perspective of someone who's worked in the executive brands, especially for, you know, uh, in incredible positions for so long. I'm a neuroscientist and an engineer. And I think in terms of appropriate structures that are in place already, I think forums like this are wonderful for the exchange between scientists, the public, and also people in government and public policy. I think also another interesting uh, way that we could increase the exchange would actually be directly bringing to top machine learning conferences, maybe having a, a workshop or a session that actually brings policymakers or people from the public sector there um, to kind of have and a direct exchange with the machine learning experts and vice versa, the machine learning experts would then directly get to communicate with people in public policy so that they could both kind of better understand the different cultures of the two areas and how we can increase the synergy. And perhaps as Dr. Ford was uh, suggesting, um, this could help to kind of provide more information to policymakers about all of the up and coming technologies and also just to have like a more general background as well in that. I also think that uh, more exchange on the in the other direction would also be great. For example, things like inviting scientists to directly to the Bureau of Consular Affairs and the Department of State to help scientists be involved in uh, helping policymakers to navigate and understand big data. So I think these are a couple of big examples. Lots of room for um, sort of trying to bridge these two different communities more effectively. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Cherub, I don't know if your connection issues are, are better. We I, I hope so, I hope so. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Um, this never happened, so I really do apologize. Uh, yeah, I, I was, I was, I was briefly saying, and actually, I'm, I'm happy to to have come third in line because I heard a few some some really interesting points from from Dr. Butcher, um, with some of which I was discussing yesterday uh, with, with 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 a colleague. So um, I'll I'll 
I'll get back to that in a second. Um, no, I, I was saying I come from a completely different end of the spectrum. And, and here, you know, we don't have you know, the deep pockets of uh, scientific and technical knowledge that our you know, government can, can, can dip into and, and get to know or learn from um, in the same way as, as, as the US has, for example. Uh, so perhaps it might be a bit less straightforward to come up with those structures. Uh, however, however, I, I, I have a bit of an interesting answer, a mixed answer to, to, to the question that you, uh, you, uh, you asked. Uh, that is, uh, for example, if I look at the, uh, the foreign, foreign affairs perspective, there seems to be a, a very strong movement internationally uh, for foreign ministers to start um, uh, gathering more information from, you know, have scientific advisors and scientific of the, or teams of scientific advisors around them. And in fact, um, there is something called the Foreign Minister Science and Technology Advice Network, uh, long, long word, uh, long, long phrase over there, which, um, which is a, a very good example of a how different science policy advisors, sorry, different science policy advisors in different countries are getting together to try and solve problems or identify issues or crises as they as they emerge. But it also shows how institutionalized science advice is becoming in, in the foreign affairs uh, in the foreign affairs world. Um, I don't have an, enough expertise to say why foreign affairs in particular, but it really seems to to have have started embedding itself there. Other parts of our political apparatus, so we say, or government apparatus, not so much. And uh, there, I, I, I'm actually interested in kind of learning more about best practices. So I don't quite have an answer for what else can be done. Um, but it's, it is clear that, you know, with the quantum apocalypse, as, as Dr. Ford says, or, or, the, or these new emerging technologies, something needs to be done. And, you know, there is a, a clear and present danger, of, you know, scientific illiteracy or technological literacy at the highest levels is extremely uh, dangerous. I, it can reach uh, funny, ridiculous proportions sometimes. So um, I'm actually reviewing um, EU funding proposals at the moment. So as an EU scientist, I can submit for funds from the EU uh, to, to, to do my research. And one of these things I need to vet for is dangers of machine learning or artificial intelligence. Even if machine learning is being used to control a thermostat in a lab, I have to sign off on it not being dangerous. And, you know, I do understand that there is this issue that, you know, these technologies can be dangerous or dual use or so on, but it does go to show just how how badly illiterate some of our policymakers are with these issues and just how important it is for us to figure out ways to better transmit what we do and the other way, also understand what the concerns are from the policymakers' perspective. I don't have a good answer for how to do that, but it is clear that you know, there is this, uh, this bit which is missing, the connective tissue, so to speak, is missing. Absolutely, and I wanna pass it over to Dr. Bertazzi now. Yes, absolutely, and uh, fascinating to hear from the different perspectives, um, possible, uh, of course, gaps and certainly some solutions. And I have to say in the biomedical sciences, I would totally concur, right? It, you know, that um, it's important that, you know, we introduce this multidisciplinarity in our, even our workforce training so that, you know, an economist can have some ability of understanding, you know, a language of biomedical sciences if presented to the challenge, uh, and the other way around, right? You know, having scientists, you know, learning to how to really interact outside of the realm of, you know, our um, uh, very, very uh, sophisticated, but at the same time, you know, very, you know, uh, focused uh, uh, training activity. So I think seeing more of these opportunities of you know, physician, you know, uh, um, lawyers, um, uh, economists that do, of course, health economy, uh, of course, policymakers that really can converse. And I found um, what Ambassador Jurab just said about foreign uh, relations um, and the role of the ministries or secretaries of foreign relations having, having that role uh, as a possible uh, important um, advance. I, I have to say in my realm of uh, currently of trying to advance these technologies for COVID-19, especially vaccines, the better engagement and relationship we had were not with ministers of health, 
but were the ministers of foreign affairs and even with the ministries of economy, because they really are the ones who have the power and not the power in the Ministry of Health. So I think that, you know, uh, learning even ourselves to do that as scientists and going just beyond speaking to ourselves, those who know science, is important. To highlight, therefore, some organizations and certainly institutions that could help with this, I am a big fan of AAAS, of course, because of the experiences that I have had, and, they, and the fact that you have opened that door, right, for, you know, training ourselves to do that, but also um, introducing us, you know, being a AAAS, for example, fellow, you can knock on doors and actually go speak, you know, in, you know, these um, more policy arenas. But let's not forget others, right? Let's not forget our societies, right? That more and more our, you know, um, in our case, tropical medicine society of microbiology societies have a more role in helping in that space. And the national academies, academies of science, technology, medicine, engineering, what, you know, whatever you wanna, you know, uh, um, uh, call it, to be more inclusive in um, really uh, shepherding this, uh, engagement because they have the uh, body of experts that then have the ability of converse. So a lot of work still to do, but I think more and more we're recognizing that we all just need to be more uh, versed in the language of how we can share our, of course, very sophisticated training, but with a, a ability of conversing it in a different um, sector or discipline. Great responses. I had uh, two more additional questions, but there's so many Q and A's that from the audience, I wanna make sure that we have enough time to, to get to some of those questions as well. Um, if we go through all, if we exhaust those questions, we can go back to some of my questions. Uh, the first question is from someone from New Zealand who first of all said that they loved all of the presentations. And their question is that a lot of diplomacy and policy sits with nation states but we're seeing a growing impact of business in emerging technologies, including space and AI. And what are the panelists' thoughts on what diplomats should be doing to build connections with businesses as well as states? And I'm gonna open that up to anybody who just wants to unmute themselves on the panelists to, to offer their thoughts. Well, maybe I can start just very briefly. I have to say they are the connectors, right? They are the gateway for um, how we can then um, have our conversations with them to then get to the to the actual you know heads of state or you know to the structure of even because they they represent you know the, their country but that they have the the access to the other country where they're of course you know sitting in right you know an ambassador or a consul general in a given country, you know, can be that gateway. And I think that, that they have, a, 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 again, a very prominent role going back to this concept of foreign relations. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a daughter of a diplomat, you know, so I know what that means. And I have had, of course, the opportunity of understanding how um, they are so valuable. So I think we need to raise their importance in especially, um, uh, navigating through again, you know, emerging technologies and how they are accepted, and ultimately, there are a level of also trusted uh, voice uh, um, that represents, you know, uh, even the, the community. So I think that an excellent, excellent question and recommendation. Dr. Ford, I would I would add that uh, it's also the case that uh, you know businesses and private sector entities and people who are actually in the sort of technology economy, you know, for a living all the time uh, are incredible potential resources uh, for information and insight into how all these things work. You know, from my perspective, I spent years working on national security export control policies. And there it's always a bit of a tension where you, you know, you, in principle, you want collaboration to be as open and free and uh, free flowing as possible because that's to the benefit of science and leads to you know more sort of effervescent uh, coming up with with neat use cases and applications for the future that'll make us all more prosperous and and you know find new answers in the scientific and technology arena um, on the other hand you don't really want to be in the business of 
helping a you know a, a state adversary solve a technical problem that they've been trying to figure out how to solve that will help their military capabilities or you know you don't necessarily want to to help build them into a sort of a competitive s t powerhouse where their objective is in fact to uh to occupy that terrain and expel uh, others specifically you know you uh, so balancing all of that is, is is hard um and we spend ages you know sort of throwing chairs at each other in in conference rooms and uh, over what the right answer should be. And there's not necessarily a given right answer, but in, in making those kinds of calls and finding that sort of balance, uh, the insights that can be provided by people who are out there in the real world doing this stuff are really vital. I mean, you do not want to trust people with my technical background sitting around all by themselves, making complicated decisions about at what level of, you know, what, what you know, how many nanometers should you restrict uh, semiconductor design tools uh, for export from the United States. You want to have people who, you know, who do, who have all kinds of perspectives upon this, including the people who make and build and design this. And, and to the degree that they can be, you know, routinely consulted and part of these discussions, um, not because they get to make the calls, but because those people who do make the calls, you know, frankly need to understand that perspective and have that insight if they're going to make good ones. So, so building that relationship also, again, once more, it's a sort of a inter-institutional part building and collaborative process. It keeps coming down to that. Um, and you can call that whatever you want. One way to describe that process of inter-institutional partnership building is diplomacy. Uh, you know, it's it's formal macro diplomacy if they happen to have diplomatic immunity and funky black US State Department passports. Uh, but it's also still diplomacy when it's you know people on this panel talking to their counterparts in foreign countries and whatever it may be. But making sure that there is many stakeholders around the table and having these discussions so that whatever decisions are made are ones that are made in as open eyed a way as possible. That's gold. Yes, uh, Ambassador Chair. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, do you mind if I answer the uh, New Zealand question? Uh, so keep, keep answering that one because I've got a, a few thoughts on that. Um, so first of all, it's, it is a very, very interesting question. Um, also coming from New Zealand, which is where Peter Gluckman is from, who is embedded in every every sort of uh, science advice foreign ministry network I know of. Um, so, uh, you know, from my perspective, New Zealand has, has played a very important role in this field. So I just want to give a shout out. Uh, shout out. Um, it, is, it is a very interesting question also because it kind of places, places this dichotomy of businesses and states. Um, I'm not going to mention the name of the country, but one of the one of the first countries I know of that had a, a tech ambassador or a digital ambassador um, embedded them in in Silicon Valley uh, at least part of the part of the time, and and the idea was um, as a as a nation state we are dealing with other states and you know Facebook <laughs> pretty much the same level, so let's let's recognize that formally and officially, and this person was was embedded in Silicon Valley, and he actually had a very very hard time getting access to the CEOs. <laughs> so, so, so what emerged from that was actually, you know, states and and, and and businesses are such that you know businesses are getting a bit more weight than state these days, um, and and you can see that you know the, the global reach of some businesses is just it is enormous, you know, compared to the largest country or the most powerful country. Countries. And 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 actually, kind of, I I I would kind of riff, you know, play, play a bit on this on this question, and kind of add a bit to uh, to that. And I feel I can do that because I'm a scientist by training. So if I make a diplomatic mistake, I can say, <laughs> uh, don't don't blame me. Uh, but 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 um, in all seriousness, I I do feel that the idea of having sort of states. Talking, talking amongst themselves and then eventually filtering down policies and et cetera, et cetera, to businesses. That does not apply to modern technologies anymore, modern world anymore. You know, when it comes to in, the internet, when it comes to the quantum ap apocalypse, again, I'm gonna use that phrase, when it comes to these modern technologies, which can give these companies such an enormous power and advantage and reach. And and I start questioning then whether we should actually revise how we, how we do this, uh, how we, engage in this discussion at state and say, should we actually um, have a concept like a platform state where a company like you know, Facebook with such an enormous reach is, is given a seat around the table as you know, with the other with the other nation states. But the converse of that is that they would also be um, held responsible to the same 
international laws and everything else. And that might allow a greater degree of, I wouldn't say control, because control is a bad word, but a, a higher level of engagement at the right level between the states and the private sector. I, I, you know, it might be a bit of a uh, sort of far-fetched idea, but but it, it does, you know, this kind of question really does cause me to think whether, you know, having this dichotomy of states and the private sector subservient to them is actually the right way of approaching it. Do you, either of the other panelists want to uh, say something? Yes, Dr. Butch? I'll just add something quickly, and I, uh, it's really fascinating hearing the perspectives of the other panelists. Um, so since the question was also, I, like maybe one practical example is the question of connections with businesses is also something that people in the academic community are actively thinking about. There's more and more thought that we need kind of these public private partnerships, especially to advance certain types of research initiatives. So actually at some of these top machine learning conferences, there are companies like DeepMind and Facebook and others that actually participate and share research at those conferences too. So if you also brought diplomats maybe as a session or something, for example, it would be a way to kind of facilitate an exchange on all sides. For uh, the next question from the audience, we had a question about thinking about the dual use, which has already been mentioned um, today as well, is how can science diplomacy contribute to avoid the dual use of AI in particular? And can it even do that? And so their example is AI developed for chemical um, warfare, how can that um, how can that actually be misused and, and try to keep it only for, for its intended use? I don't know if anybody wants to take on a very difficult challenge of, of how can you make something very good with emerging technologies that can clearly also be used for, for something uh, not as intended. That's a, Dr. Ford. that's a subcategory of a much broader question of how to struggle with dual use applications in the first place. Now, maybe it's a harder one in the sense that you know, I would imagine that AI questions are ones that involve more intangible stuff, right? I mean, the traditional, the, you know, the, the old days paradigmatic dual use thing is some particular component or widget or device that has some potential military application, but also does lots of cool things in the civilian context. And what do you do about that? How do you build appropriate mechanisms for control and who gets to have access to that and so forth? Uh, in the national security export control business that, that, I, that I to some degree come out of uh, as, a, as a policymaker, um, you know, that type of question is one that we struggle with all the time. Now, I, you know, AI is you know, probably especially hard for a bunch of reasons, not just because it's intangible, but because well, it's very fast moving. It is very hard to define. You can define a chemical explosive. You can define a, a reagent that goes into, say, a Novichok, you know, Russian illegal chemical weapon. Uh, it's really hard to even, at least from my perspective, I don't, you know, I'll defer to others who have, you know, real technical knowledge, but you know, I haven't heard a really sound and clear and crisp definition of what artificial intelligence actually is in the first place, which makes it really hard to wrap one's minds around it. You know, if you were to be talking about you know, regulatory steps and so forth, I like the approach the Pentagon has taken on AI. Uh, for example, a couple of years ago in articulating a series of sort of architectural principles for how it proposes to look at AI questions in the context of uh, military applications and warfighting. Um, that's not the same thing as assessing any given piece, you know, any given program or, or AI data set or, or the synergy between them. It is a, you know, sort of a structural process for how it is that the institution of the Defense Department is you know, pledges to think about these issues in the future to make sure that applications of AI are done as ethically and appropriately as possible. There, you know, there may be ways to, to think through the kind of principled architecture approach there, but as a general matter, we do spend a lot of time trying on any technology to think about where to draw kind of an export control line. Um, and there are, you know, these are national level policies in essentially every country to some degree or another. There are multilateral regimes, such as the Bosnar arrangement that deal with uh, essentially dual use, uh, you know, non-WMD sorts of, of things. Uh, and as well as a bunch of other regimes that, that you know, there's, there's they're, inter they're multilateral regimes that cover nuclear applications. There are, you know, there's a uh, missile technology Control regime. There's Vassanar. There's the Australia Group. The Zango Committee. There's a there's a range of institutions out there that are devoted to countries getting getting countries together to think about what appropriate restraint looks like. Now they don't always you know work super well. Some of them work better than others. It's a you know it's a mixed bag, but but the process of thinking those through 
oneself as a country and having one's diplomats engage with those regimes to encourage others to have similar views or to negotiate what the right answer should be in that context. That's a normal thing to do. Um, and it's part of our challenge now to apply that normal thing that is more traditionally accustomed to hardware um, to more intangible, funkier, faster moving, a little more protein and undefined areas um, going forward. There's legislation in the US that requires us to be thinking through uh, a framework for emerging technologies. I think that's the ECRA legislation, if I remember correctly. Um, and at least when I was still in government, we had been on a process to, to do that. I don't know whether that process has stalled or what the situation is, but you know, we, we are actually not just, it's not just a good idea to think about this some, it is a requirement of US legislation that our bureaucrats you know, do some of this. I hope that this will indeed move forward, but you know, nor do I know what the answers are going to be, but uh, um, it, there is active engagement on this. And I think we need to be frankly, more assiduous, more energy behind it and, and you know, wiser in trying to bring these questions to bear. It's a, that's a long winded way of saying it's a great question and we are struggling with it, but uh, it is very much still, uh, still a work in progress. Do any of the other panelists wanna talk about this issue of the dual use? I could yeah. just, uh, just add a little bit um, from the perspective of a scientist and someone working in AI. I agree that it's a great question and it's there's not a easy answer to that that question at all. I think something people on kind of the academic science community, uh, how they could contribute to thinking about the, the dangers and the risks of dual use is by having international uh, collaborations on thinking about the ethics of AI and also exploring, uh, like, um, as was mentioned, AI is a really big umbrella term. So breaking it down into kind of specific uses of it and then exploring the potential for each of those uses to for for good and for bad and then kind of um, you know consolidating that together and maybe uh, get, you know writing a white paper or something with uh, and presenting it to policymakers but um, I think kind of trying to get ahead of it and of course like it's a moving target so you can't look at every application simultaneously, but you could kind of highlight a few of them, for example, the chemical warfare that was mentioned. And I think that person cited an article that was written based on an international security conference. So I guess that's one application or one example, kind of a, a positive exploration of dual use that would be important. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask another question, um, and it's about, you know, the the balance between that we're kind of talked about in the previous question, the balance between the tremendous opportunities of emerging technologies, yet some of these technologies also create potential threats. And so the question is, what concerns you the most about the future developments in the technologies that you're focused on? Yes, go, go right ahead. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Um, I the quantum apocalypse. I'm going to use this every single time. <laughs> no, no, it, but it, it, it is it is it is true. I mean, um, one has to, of course, disentangle the hype of quantum technologies from the real application. But what seems to be emerging from our field is that there is a, a class of problems which we thought were unbreakable, which are almost not trivial, but become much, much easier to, to, to tackle. And these underlie all our security mechanisms. That, that, is, that is scary. But for exactly the same reasons, um, quantum computers are better suited, much better suited, as for example, predicting um, protein folding mechanism, basically helping us to understand the structure of life, helping us understand how uh, drugs um, cure us of diseases and so on and so forth. Uh, so it, it is exactly the same mechanism that gives us both the scary prospect, but also the really good stuff. And and uh, I um, I don't know where to draw the line. I don't know how to draw the line. And you know, I, I I fancy myself more of a scientist on this side of things. Uh, you know, if if something is is interesting and can be done and has potential positive effects, let's go for it. But you know. Every aspect of, uh, of these emerging technologies, or many aspects can be, uh, can be seen in this framework. Quantum communications is another one. It is all well and good to say we have unbreakable communications, 
but there are legitimate reasons for being able to tap into communication systems. Uh, governments have that power, whether we like it or not, they should, in my opinion, but you know, ultimately they do. Should we deprive them of this, of this power? Is that an ethical thing to do, actually? Uh, but what if then criminals get their hands on this technology? It, 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 is, it is an incredibly fraught, uh, fraught question. I don't know what the answer is, but it is one which we struggle with in quantum physics all the time. Uh, Dr. Batazzi first, and then Dr. Ford. Yes, from my perspective, and, and if we focus, for example, on some of, some of the um, arguments that we, of course, uh, wanted to balance in our piece, is um, the notion that, for example, now everybody um, thinks that RNA technology is going to come and solve every, everybody's problem, all the problems that we have in vaccine development, you know, for all the diseases that we need to develop vaccines for. And that's where I think, uh, and therefore all the funding, all the interest, all the creation of new infrastructure capacity, it's navigating towards this emerging technology, which is a wonderful technology, but we don't know if it's going to actually work for anything else beyond COVID-19 at this point. Um, there may be some hints that may, of course, be a great technology, eventually may become a conventional technology, you know, with, you know, the deep, you know, um, learning curve that you have to establish. But I think it, you know, what worries me is this, you know, tunnel vision, you know, that, you know, everybody, Peter Hotez always says is like, you know, you have a new, a new, uh, uh, like in a soccer field, you have the ball and all the little kids fall that ball, right? You know, and, you know, and, 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 and therefore you didn't neglect the fact that ultimately in this world, we need to keep a balance, right? Of, you know, there are some things that will work very well with emerging technologies as they are understood, as they are of course accepted, as they are evolving. And, and we want new technologies to come in because we want progress, right? But we should not do it um, uh, hampering the fact that you still need to sustain and have other options, you know, uh, readily available. And I think that's what worries me that we're just going too extreme into uh, then, you know, forgetting that we may have some things that are, are still very useful, certainly much more affordable, and that ultimately are the ones who really we should be uh, using to achieve, you know, equity in, the, in our case, equity in vaccine uh, uh, access. Thank you very much. Dr. Ford, you had some comments? Well, I would just say, I mean, to, to answer the question of what concerns me, um, maybe the most, certainly a lot, um, I would back it out from the technologists themselves for a moment and, and think and play my policy wonk card, my non-technical guy card. But what worries me to some degree hugely is a sort of mismatch between rates of advance in the development of policy answers and regulatory frameworks and export control regimes and whatever you want to point to. The policy community has its rate of advance and then the technology community has its rate of advance. And when you're talking about these sort of emerging technology areas, these are rates of advance that are really very different from each other. Um, there's, a, there's an Air Force colonel and military theorist years ago by the name of John Boyd who had this idea of what was called an OODA loop. That's O-O-D-A, it stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. There's a way to conceive, well, originally it came out of air warfare on how fast can you maneuver and not get caught by the other guy. But it's a basic concept that if I can observe my environment, orient myself within it, decide what to do and act on the basis of that, and then repeat that cycle at a faster rate than you can, I am intrinsically going to have an advantage in dealing with you, or you're going to get out ahead, uh, or I'm going to get out ahead of your ability to react. And I worry that the, tech, the development of emerging technologies is, you know, has an OODA loop that is shorter than the policy community's ability to come up with sensible S&T policy, uh, or at least it's, it's really challenged to keep up with fast moving stuff. And, and keeping that gap from becoming too problematic is, is one of the things that worries me a lot. Uh, I don't know how to fix it, but I think that I would point to that as much as any given technology issue itself. Over. Great. Um, for this question, it might be more uh, for the the folks that are current, uh, still current researchers. Um, so maybe you, Dr. Butch and Dr. Botazzi. Uh, the question is: Can you get give us a sense of how you split your time between research and science and diplomacy or policy work, or more information on how they might fit together on a day to day? You want to go first, Amanda? 
Oh, sure, sure. So uh, I'm at an earlier stage in my career. I'm a postdoctoral fellow now who I uh, recently obtained my PhD in neuroscience. So for me, how I balance science research and diplomacy may look different than later on in my career. Uh, during my graduate studies, I uh, is actually when I first learned about kind of the field of science diplomacy. So how that looked was at Rockefeller University, I was able to take courses in science diplomacy, which introduced us to a, a number of amazing speakers and allowed us to have conversations on a range of topics. And so, you know, that was uh, a few hours every week. And then, of course, the conversations with the other people taking the class would kind of continue. And uh, throughout my PhD, I also pursued uh, work in science communication, which is not the same as diplomacy, but I think is kind of one important tool for, for uh, science diplomacy. So now uh, the way that balance works is kind of uh, adapting, but I'm interested in being involved um, kind of part-time, like, uh, you know, like, I don't know, a, a number of hours per week in interacting with people at, for example, National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. I've talked to some of the board directors there. So there may be some opportunities to, for me to kind of participate uh, in the policy advising and learn more about that as well. And, and then there's also opportunities uh, as a graduate student uh, who's kind of at the, in the later stages and also in a postdoctoral fellow to participate in a number of internships where you're full-time doing science diplomacy uh, some or, or policy advising. And then you can return to your research and kind of take those skills there or decide to be full-time in policy. So that, that's something I'm still figuring out the balance. Well, Dr. Butch, thank you for that because I wish I had those opportunities when I was in your situation position at the time. And I have to say that that is something that I'm very happy to see the evolution of how even within academic institutions, we are now not thinking about policy, diplomacy, engagement as a hobby that you know is not encouraged and is not supported you know you know within our training you know uh, um, i guess uh, uh, career and and advancement and um, now in fact you know i think that's key right to be able to integrate it even within the very hard course uh, hard sciences of training of scientific you know disciplines you know incorporate you know these opportunities so in my case I ended up now doing, I do a lot more, you know, the science engagement policy advocacy than hardcore scientific, you know, certainly I don't do bench work anymore, but I, but we have a team, right? Then now we, we, we help direct um, and, you know, uh, uh, share our experiences. And I, uh, albeit I've had now uh, relatively later in my professional career, had the opportunities of getting myself my own training um, I got that curiosity very early on, you know, again, since, you know, growing even in a family of, you know, diplomats and certainly business entrepreneurs, I'm the only scientist, but then seeing it clearly when I was actually doing my postdoc in the Pennsylvania area, uh, because I saw, you know, all the pharmaceuticals and all, you know, these, you know, business uh, around me in the context of, you know, of, uh, of Penn. And I ended up, you know, getting into a, a business degree as a hobby at that time, right? And now seeing how that has brought a lot of value in, you know, being who I am now and the interest. And then again, going back to the importance of societies and associations such as AAAS. So I think it's key uh, that we fold it into now, not as a, just as an, as an add-on kind of hobby, but in fact, you know, to formalize it within our training and, and open more of these opportunities. Um, great, I know that I could continue this conversation for, for much longer and we did not, we didn't have enough time to get to all the wonderful um, questions, but I do wanna be respectful of time. But before closing the event, I wanna give the panelists an opportunity to say um, some final comments, but uh, probably brief final comments due to time. 
and so I'll just go, uh, we'll go in the opposite order of uh, who spoke. So Dr. Butch. Um, so uh, just to, to wrap up, I think, um, you know, it's, this is this kind of exchange and conversation is a really important uh, way that we can come together to use science diplomacy to tackle the challenges of emerging technologies. And I encourage all of the people who are attending here to keep participating in this community and to talk to, you know, whoever is in your in your sphere, whether it's your friends, family or colleagues about these topics, because I think that will be really critical to engage with everyone. And Ambassador Cherub. Um, thank you. Um, again, thanks for the invite. Um, I just want to say that, you know, something you know, building on what uh, Professor Batati was saying, um, yeah, the idea of, of, of engaging as, as scientists and technical people with, with the outside world, that I had completely missed. You know, that importance was just not apparent to me when I was younger, uh, well, when I was studying anyway. And, and during my postdoctoral years, I, I realized just how essential it is to justify to taxpayers why we're spending their dollars, their euros in, in, in the things that we're doing. And later on to policymakers and helping them not just explaining what way or why they should give us the budget, but also helping to direct uh, the future of our countries and the way our countries interact together in and help them move move up move forward in that direction and I see all of these as being you know different sides of the same coin so to speak and it was it's fascinating seeing seeing these perspectives again thank you and it was a, an extreme pleasure from my end uh, Dr. Foy uh, just just very quickly I guess I would stress how interesting and important s and diplomacy is at this particular time because we are in a technologically competitive environment in ways that we perhaps a generation ago didn't really anticipate. Maybe we should have, but we didn't. Uh, and s and diplomacy, when the world looks, you know, happy and benign, um, you know, largely revolves, I would assume, around just trying to encourage more and more collaboration and more and more advancement of knowledge. And that's awesome. And that is still a huge piece of what we need to be doing. Um, the problem is in a competitive context, you also have to worry about all kinds of other downsides and security and geopolitical issues. And you know, so the stakes for S&T diplomacy are higher now than they have been in, in quite a few years. Um, you know, the stake, you know, the, the result of a bad decision in this context isn't just the opportunity cost of not doing some cool knowledge building that would otherwise have happened. The opportunity, you know, the, the, the cost of a bad decision now could be very, very dramatic indeed. And so the stakes are high and that makes this super important so thank you for getting us focused even even more uh, upon these challenges and i've got to run but thank you so much everyone thank you so much and dr Batati. yes thank you and in fact i'm going to build on uh, some words from uh, ambassador ford about the pace the pace of the science versus the pace of the policy and of course the uh, advocacy and engagement and i think my remarks is indeed we need to work on that. We need to make policy making and policy driven activities more flexible and adaptable to be able to be more accelerated and catch up with the science and technology advances. There was a question in the chat that basically said, you know, uh, about the challenges of the vaccines, albeit, you know, production scientifically manufacturing are challenging. It's really been the, the policy, regulatory, you know, how do you bring in these vaccines to the world? You know, how do you get them approved? How do you get them accepted by the population? So we have a disconnect, a disconnect on the pace. And so we need to modernize policy making and policy uh, uh, communication and advocacy to be as uh, adaptive and as flexible uh, and not as bureaucratic to be able to adapt very quickly and to align up with science and technology advances. Um, so thank you very much for this opportunity again. Uh, well, thank you to all, um, to everybody, all the panelists and all the uh, people who participated in this event. We're looking forward to publishing more special issues of the science and diplomacy that are on specific topics. And the goal is then to pair them with events like this one to discuss the topic with the broader science diplomacy community. I wanna thank all the authors who contributed to this special issue of science diplomacy focused on emerging technology. That of course includes our four distinguished panels who spoke today, but also many other authors, and uh, some of which I know were uh, attended the webinar. 
So thank you very much to making this special issue a, su a success. I also want to thank all the reviewers and the editors for their work on the special issue. I know that some reviewers also attended this event today and really want to thank them for their hard work and efforts on the special issue. I want to give another thanks to the panelists for participating in today's webinar and really providing a great discussion on this very important issue. I want to thank all the attendees for sharing their time with us today and asking these very insightful questions um, that have, have really led to an interesting and rich discussion. Um, and finally, I want to thank all the folks at AAAS who helped put on this event, which includes people from IT, meetings, and science diplomacy teams, and this event would not be made, wouldn't be possible without their hard work. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we recorded this webinar and we will post it on our website so that maybe if people couldn't attend today, they will have the opportunity to, to listen to this webinar. Um, so thank you very much. I think we've heard a lot about connective tissue and need for relationship building, and I hope in a very small way this webinar helped do some of that relationship building today. So thank you very much. Thank you.